what we're going to look for is instead of having a a friendly conversation every 90 days as part of a QBR, quarterly business review with an account and discovering, oh, there might be an opportunity here. What if instead I could create predictive scoring based off of analysis of all those data points that I know matter to that outcome? In this case, let's say cross-sell or upsell. And I have all workflow automations in place so that I'm alerted the moment that they're that the aggregate of these conditions show me they have a high likelihood to be ready to upsell. And there are no disqualifying conditions like in a renewal period or stalled in onboarding or a decision maker left the account or something like that. Have you ever wondered what happens behind the scenes of a startup? Join me and my CEO, Keith, as we take you on a journey from private conversations to public sharing of our launch planning, product roadmap, and customer discussions. This is Launch and Learn, building in public. Yeah, let's uh, let's jump into it. Um, you know, one of the things that I think uh, we has kind of come up a few times this, this week uh, is around, uh, you know, customer data and you know, not just like collecting it, but making it useful. And I, I think that's a conversation we have a lot. So yeah, I'd love to hear kind of what you're thinking on that is and how you've kind of crystallized that in your mind. Yeah, this whole idea of data unification, it's really a symptom of a, <clears throat> of a, a deeper goal people are trying to achieve, which is how do we standardize the stuff that works? Mm. We have... We have uh, a bunch of reps, sales reps. Mm -hmm. What differentiates the great ones from the not great ones? We have a bunch of CSMs. What differentiates the great CSMs from the not great ones? It's easy for us to say intelligence, aptitude, uh, effort. But more often than not, the great ones have figured out a process or have figured out an insight that per matters particularly. Mm. And a lot, a lot of teams right now, because of what they're dealing with with market conditions, and are thinking a lot about efficiency and uh, employee productivity, and making sure that the resources we spend money on are worth it. Um, they're thinking a lot about how do we how do we standardize the stuff that works so we can replicate it at scale. That's really what data unification is about or data mm -hmm. understanding, all these tools about capturing data and, and storing it and, and transforming it and moving it around and visualizing it. It's all trying to get to this, hey, this is the stuff that makes an impact and this is the stuff we should act on. And we're gonna standardize that and make it repeatable across every individual contributor. Yeah. So when we talk about data unification, because we said it a bunch and we talk about it a lot, like maybe we should similarly, as we did last week with voice of the customer, maybe we lay down our, our definition of, of what we mean by, by data unification. I think, uh, I think the, the hill I'm going to die on is the purpose of data unification. Mm -hmm. Okay. The definition of data unification I think someone, most people would have some common sense understanding of like get everything we have in one place so we can have a thorough and accurate um, assessment of it and what matters and what we need to act on and why it's important. So like data unification is all about the process of taking all this stuff that we learn and capture and track across every team and tool in the business and let's get it in one location so we can do something with it. Mm. Okay. What I think the problem with the current kind of like data stack ecosystem is the what we do with it. So let's talk about all the data tools that exist out in the space, right? There are tools designed to capture data. The simple ones are like analytics tools. They capture data about product usage. But every uh, workflow tool used by a team, a CRM, a support ticketing system, a survey tool, a customer success platform, a project management tool, a note-taking tool, an analytic, like all of those tools are data capture systems, okay? They're capturing some insight, some bit of data about our customers and their relationship or experience with our product and business, okay? They're 
hundreds of those tools. All right. And the problem with that, the reason we even needed the the rest of the data stack was we had a bunch of teams with partial bits of the story. Hmm. Sales team had a little bit. Support has some of the story. Success has part of the story. Product management has part of the story. The only one that has the complete story is actually the customer who is the one interacting across all those touch points. So the data tech stack that has been introduced over you know the past slowly but surely over the past 20 years in SaaS is basically said okay we're capturing all this data now that we have data uh, we have applications that are capturing it but we need to get a more comprehensive understanding of it okay you can think about sales and marketing sure sales can have a phone call with a prospect but if sales knows what marketing knows about what that prospect did on the website it helps that sales call a whole lot Okay, so this data capture thing was where we started. And then we kind of needed a place to put it all. Mm -hmm. We really needed to put it all in one place. So we knew we had a comprehensive view of it. So data storage became a thing, right? So you're thinking about data warehouses, uh, like a snowflake or something. Let's get all the data in our company and let's put it here. Typically, though, we're capturing a lot of data that isn't actually relevant to our understanding of a customer. So these kind of like storage and transformation tools like customer data platform, CDPs like Segment appeared. So it's like, okay, let's only take the subset of data specific to customers and let's put it in a place where it's pseudo standardized. Okay, so that's how we kind of got to these CDPs. We take, we have all this data and all these tools. Let's corral all that into a warehouse so we have the system of record. I don't need a lot of that. Let's get the stuff I do need to route my customers into a CDP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Frontline individual contributor can't use that CDP. That's right. I've never met a sales rep on the planet that can go do anything with Segment. These yeah. are engineering. These are technologies. This is These are technical tools for technical teams. Okay. So we started saying, okay, well, we've, we've collected a lot. We've wrangled it. We've got it in a place, right? But now we need to get it to the people to do something with. And there's kind of been two approaches to that. Um, one has been moving it. Okay. So let's say like a reverse ETL. Let's take some data in a place and go put it in one of those original workflow tools that a team uses. So we're going to take some of this raw data. We're going to put it there. So now I'm a sales rep and I can see in Salesforce a bunch of Pendo events that came from Pendo via our CDP and then reverse ETL like high touch outed to Salesforce, some shit like that. Okay. Or there's been a, let's not move it. Let's visualize it. So rather than see a bunch of raw data in a in a workflow tool that you you know it's hard for you to actually do anything with, maybe if we give you line graphs and bar charts and um, pie graphs, then you'll be able to make sense of it and really do something with it. And that's really where we stop. Mm -hmm. Like the extent of what most people think about in what I will call democratization of data is let's get let's have technical people get all of our data standardized in one place and then let's take that data and create pretty reports for it that a frontline person responsible not for data but for an outcome like revenue or retention can look at the reports to see everything they need to know about the data it's just not true though right okay so when we think about kind of like the modern data stack there are hundreds of tools for capturing data. There are dozens of tools for storing that data, transforming it, moving it around, and now visualizing it. But the big gap that I feel like people are starting to finally acknowledge is that there are very few tools that help an individual contributor on the front lines understand the data in a way that allows them to do the job they're responsible for, which is driving revenue, driving retention, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Like a report, a data scientist looks at a report and sees something very different than your average frontline revenue person, right? I mean, we, we don't speak that language. A data scientists might be able to see a pie graph and kind of immediately understand what, he's, what they're looking at. But a salesperson is just their eyes are just going to glaze over and probably not even look at it. Yeah, I mean, like, a, a, I can make you a beautiful bar chart 
of uh, or line graph of user activity in an account over time. Okay, that's that's data visualization. People have those in Tableau reports and Looker dashboards and so on and so forth. Okay, but understanding product that product activity has occurred is not the same as understanding what weight product activity actually has on an outcome that I care about, like retention. Yeah. Okay. Or that product activity is only relevant for specific users within specific time periods based off the outcome that that customer is trying to achieve. Right. So it's like, yes, I can visualize a, a single type of data in a graph. And I can do that dozens of times with different graphs focused on different types of data. And that's great for visualization. But that is not the same thing as triangulating understanding. I want to know what does product activity of this very specific type from this very specific user in the account, uh, how does that play well with uh, what I know about their feedback and needs and sentiment captured across various interactions and touch points relative to the contract length, what they've purchased from us, how much of what they've purchased they've used, so on and so I want to know what all that means to churn. Right. As the, but that that is hard for teams to do today. It, it's it's impossible for teams to do automatically today because the tools have focused on taking raw data and doing something with it, putting it here, visualizing it in a graph instead of a, a row in a table. Yeah, but not translating it, not giving it meaning. That's right. Not giving it meaning. That's right. Really. And, and that's, that's ultimately these companies are built from individual humans on the front lines interacting with prospects and customers and leads. These companies get to a, a level of scale because those people drive an outcome. And those people are you know, uh, increasingly under more pressure to meet you know, increasing goals and more responsibilities. In a more competitive market than ever, in a more challenging market than in a long time because of... Um, of the economy, right? Like there's more competition than ever vying for the same finite pool of customers. It's incredibly competitive. So listen, when you were the first CRM or the second, and there were no other uh, CRMs or SaaS tools, you had first mover advantage. But fast forward 20 years and there are dozens of tools chopping up the available pie of attention of a hundred different ways. And you have these individual contributors that are responsible for overcoming that. And then, but they don't have what they need to do their job. So, you know, like I, we talk a lot about democratization of access to the insights, but it's not really about access. It's really about democratization of understanding right. to, to the insights that are hidden in that data. Right. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, when we talk to, to teams, they'll say stuff like we track product usage. It's like, well, no shit, but do you, do you actually know with certainty that which specific behaviors that you're tracking and all that product usage actually signal cross-sell readiness with a high degree of correlation? And do you know which ones are doing that right now? So that that rep responsible for them can go reach out right now. You know, okay, yeah, you got customer health scores. But do you actually know if the individual factors in those health scores that you've built pseudo arbitrarily, smart people build customer health scores using um, intuition and instinct, but you actually know the impact of each individual condition in that score on churn? Right. Right. Yeah, you got great Tableau reports sick and all of your reps can go log into tableau to see uh some 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 charts for them um but do those tableau reports triangulate all of that data and just give you a list of the 10 customers that are ready to upsell right now right or we got zendesk support tickets great that's nice we want to know that we have zendesk support tickets 
But do we have any understanding of which critical needs are actually blocking which renewals right now that our product team should go prioritize at this exact moment? Right? It's like individual contributors are responsible for outcomes. Data is only useful if it improves our ability to drive those outcomes. And just moving data into a tool I log into daily, which is the goal of reverse ETLs, or visualizing data in a place that I have to go other than the tool I spend daily and I see um, pretty vanilla graphs for the stuff I care about, that does not help drive outcomes. It may be a proxy for the outcome. It may be a proxy for the actual understanding which drives to the outcome, but it isn't the understanding itself. So is this, uh, quoting uh, Don Rumsfeld, is this a known unknown? Do companies know that they're missing this? Or is it just kind of like, well, we have the data and the fact that that data is not particularly useful to the people that need it doesn't really bubble up to the powers that be? I think this is a case of people... Um, <laughs> okay. I heard a saying last year that I have not been able to shake and it has nothing to do with business. It's about life. And the statement was everything is infinitely deep. Okay. And over the last year, I have found that to be so true. Even like in the simplest of use cases, I got recommended a YouTube video eight months ago about the risk board game world championships. And I was like, what? Like risk is a Milton Bradley game or Parker brothers game. I don't know, you know, for kids. And then you went down the rabbit hole. And, and then I went down the rabbit hole and was yeah, blown away. Everything is like that. And I think, I think from the, from a cursory glance at any endeavor or subject or topic, you might assume that it doesn't have infinite depth. And I kind of feel like that's the case with this. So when you say a known unknown, I feel like in, uh, instinctually people that do these jobs know that the more data they have, the better off they'll be in driving an outcome. And so they know that getting access to that data is important. And for convenience sake, they want to make it easy to get access to that data for the people that need it, frontline individual contributors. But I don't think they understand how infinitely deep this goes. So I think they think about if I put data in that capture tool, Pendo, in that capture and storage tool, Salesforce, then I've done it. Check. Right. And then some people say, I, I don't know what these raw, raw events mean. And then the team says, aha, you're right. We'll go a layer deeper. We will take it and we will put it in a visualization tool, Tableau, Power BI, Looker, and we will visualize it and then give you access to a report where it visualizes the data. We've done it. And then shockingly, teams still struggle to drive the outcomes they care about. Mm -hmm. And it's the next step that I don't think people are making the leap to. Like there's more of the iceberg hidden below the surface. And so is it a known unknown? I think people know that it matters, that more access, that more data, more comprehensive under, uh, context is going to be beneficial to driving an outcome we care about. Uh, making that making those insights accessible will ensure that the individual contributors use it, right? But then I think people stop there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they take that next step to, yes, but it's not about visualizing that type of data, that one piece of data in that chart over time. The goal is to triangulate across all of the pieces of data that we capture across every team and tool in the business, how the aggregate of those 10 points uh, impact this outcome or predict this outcome or drive this outcome. So I feel like this is a case of everything is infinitely deep and we think we're deep into that trench, 
but we are not. We are still in the shallow, the shallow side of the pool. Yeah. So I actually, I read an article or it was part of an article and it's, it's hard for me to believe this, but maybe it was a short seller trying to push the stock down. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but it was talking about Salesforce and how up until very recently, they were not tracking the like which sales reps were closing more deals than others. They did not know who the bottom 5% of sales reps were and that they wanted to implement this and they got pushback because it created an, like a bad environment for the workforce. Um, um, I think they've now apparently started implementing that. But I, I mean, it's very hard for me to believe it. But let, let's say that's illustrative of a trend that existed in that zero interest rate environment or mm -hmm. zero interest rate phenomena that we are now longer in. in um, and companies are now, you know, being much more diligent. So is this the moment that this becomes more relevant than ever? It's a it's a good external motivator. It's a good external forcing function. So. I actually believe that the over, I'm going to call it overabundance of available capital has made technology companies, startups successful in spite of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there is a whole lot of bloat in technology companies. Yeah. Uh, appalling amount of bloat. But everything is relative. So it didn't seem like things were that bloated when capital was everywhere. Capital ain't everywhere. Right. You can right. raise money, but you can raise money, but most investors are wanting uh right. they're not looking to give you these uh up rounds. Right. right. My mom worked in finance and she used to say that there's a saying, I think it might be Warren Buffett. Um, when the tide goes in, you see you learn who's swimming naked. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It seems to be a lot of naked swimmers right now. <laughs> yeah. So listen, I think I think technology companies in particular, because of the attractiveness of SaaS unit economics and thus the overabundance of venture capital for growing those companies, the outcome has been a, a ton of bloat. And um, we're at the point now where capital isn't available or as available as it was um, to as many players in the space as it was. And so people are desperately either saying, you know, people are trying to respond to it. And one way to respond to it that's common is we have got to make sure that we spend this money intelligently so we survive long enough to get to the next boom in fundraising. Right. I mean, that is that is just how it is. I mean, I have heard VCs go from saying, when we raised our first round of funding, Bank Capital Ventures, our initial investor, put a ton of pressure on me to spend all the money in 12 months. Ton of pressure. It was a point of tension that we were not spending the money that quickly. Um, I have now heard investors telling companies, try and raise 48 months worth. <laughs> 40, 48 months of runway. I mean, it's absurd. It's like, it's crazy. But you understand it because now people are like, holy shit, we don't know how long this is going to go on or how long this whole market is going to be depreciated and how long uh, I'm going to have to go by being as lean as possible. So anyways, when you ask if it's now the moment, I think that the bloat has surfaced and we're all forced to acknowledge it. And teams are trying to figure out how to address that bloat so that they can be around long enough to get to the next milestone. Um, and one way to do that is reduce spend. Yeah. Right. So listen, if I told you we spend a dollar on this person and they bring us $5, even in this market, we're not getting rid of them. Right. But if I told you we spend a dollar on this person, they bring us 80 cents. We're getting rid of them. Even worse. I spend a dollar on this person and I don't know what they bring us. And I think that's more of the problem. Today. That's the problem. Exactly right. Yeah. So what teams are, what teams are, they don't have to go down this path though. Okay. So this is the whole point I'm making about data unification for the purpose of data understanding in order to standardize how we run a proven process. 
across every rep, across every CSM, across every employee. So, yes, um, we really need to shrink our overhead. Or we need we need to be more efficient. Let me just take it there. We need to be more efficient with our spend. So we spend the same or less, and we get more out of it. We got to get better at it. That's what people are thinking. All right. One way to spend less is to drop resources, to fire. A lot of people have done that. <laughs> Shocking number of people have done that. And who are they going to fire? They're not going to fire the best reps. They're going to lay off those that, I'm not going to say underperform, just that have a lower value of a replacement player. Okay. But what if they're actually not less valuable via aptitude or effort than the high, the high VORP players? You know, what if they just haven't figured out how to standardize a process using the same inputs that the high impact players have, which goes back to my question of great reps versus not great reps. Is it really aptitude and effort? I would challenge that. I'm sure that's the case sometimes, but in general, what if we could take the, the playbook that the best employees and best reps and the most impactful and valuable players are putting into play daily and weekly at our companies. And what if we could standardize and replicate that across every player? Would we actually say we need to fire all these players? Probably not. So what I think has happened in the market is is, is caused this catalyst where people are starting to say, we need to be more mature and thoughtful about all of, about our excess and about our investments and making sure that what we invest in has a material impact on our business in an exchange rate we're happy with. And they look at the great people and they say, they pass that, 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 uh, that test. And then they look at the not great people and they say, they don't pass that test. What do we do? The gut instinct is to say, we drop them. But maybe the right thing to say is instead, no, if they are actually capable with some standardization and guidance, you should keep them because they already know your business. You've already invested the upfront cost of onboarding and training and knowledge transfer. Keep them, but standardize what the good people are doing well and make it repeatable for the for the currently not great people. Right. Right. And so, yes, I think ultimately this is about standardizing or and replicating the standard operating procedure that we have proven leads to the best outcome. So why don't we uh, kind of make that a little bit more tangible? Um, we talk about like, you know, um, making it understandable for the frontline person. So from our perspective, imperative, our, you know, the product we offer, the service we offer, what does that actually look like? What is the actual deliverable that a frontline sales rep or account manager or success manager or head of revenue, like uh, what do they receive? that is different than let's say some tableau report or just raw data it depends on the team so we can just pick a team for the sake of conversation um let's pick um let's pick a team responsible for getting more out of the customers we currently have right a very important topic incredibly important given the pressure in the market and how few company how many companies are tightening their purse strings and not investing in new functionality. I mean, we had two calls with prospects today that are like, we want to do this. We know we need to do this. We have to get over this like, but guys, we said we were going to freeze spend hiccup, right? Like they just know it. Like everyone's dealing with this. So net revenue retention is a key thing. Let's keep as much as we of what we already have and let's get more out of it. All right. So let's talk about the get more out of it. Um, how does, in most SaaS companies, how does the get more out of it identification occur? I've identified an opportunity for getting more. It happens in a QBR. It happens in a fucking conversation that was booked 90 days prior. And we just happen to say, you know, oh, um, I see you've um, clicked on this button. Did you know we could also do this? 
<laughs> right? Like, uh, oh, you mentioned a new team in passing anecdotally. Maybe we should talk about adding seats for them. <laughs> I mean, that's the extent of what we're talking about here. Like, mm -hmm. this is how most people discover more. So if we're just talking about that use case, again, we're going to go back to the beginning, data unification. So let's look at all data captured across every touch point we have with that, cons that customer and touch points we don't directly capture, but someone out in the world does. And let's use that as, as inputs to predict or understand each customer's readiness for more. So for example, let's take a look at um, their employee count. Has the company grown in size recently? Mm -hmm. If they're on a hiring spree, their employee count is growing. That tells you something about the trajectory of the business. Right. Did they raise around the funding? That tells you something about the business. Did a new decision maker join the company that used our product at a prior company? That tells you something interesting about opportunity within it. Those are all inputs that most teams never consider or look at really. Okay, because they're not there, the data is not readily available or packaged into a mechanism that allows a frontline individual contributor to quickly understand the impact of those individual inputs. Okay, so we have market conditions basically. All right, um, what about their tech stack? Do we know that they use a tool that is a competitor for a product line we already use? Have a recently acquired it or recently gotten rid of it? That is a pretty compelling input to a swap, a replacement. Let's take non-market stuff, non-firmographic, non-technographic stuff, non-intent events. Have they been on our website looking at uh, product pages? Have they read a knowledge base article related to adding an integrate, setting up an integration that's not in their contract? Have they tried? Where are they in, uh, consuming the units of volume? We sold them in the contract. What is the uh, activity of the key decision maker in the account? What is the health of the key decision maker or champion in the account? In the account? Um, how many outstanding product requests or items of feedback exist for key people that will make decisions in this account? Like I could just keep going. All right. So what we're going to look for is instead of having a, a friendly conversation every 90 days as part of a QBR, quarterly business review with an account, and discovering, oh, there might be an opportunity here. What if instead I could create predictive scoring based off of analysis of all those data points that I know matter to that outcome? In this case, let's say cross-sell or upsell. And I have all workflow automations in place so that I'm alerted the moment that they're that the aggregate of these conditions show me they have a high likelihood to be ready to upsell and there are no disqualifying conditions like in a renewal period or stalled in onboarding or a decision maker left the account or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then let's automate what that rep does or should have done, would have done otherwise manually when that happens, right? So when we talk about the understanding, we're talking about, uh, we're, we're going to talking about through the lens of a specific outcome an individual contributor is trying to drive. Everyone, it should be revenue and retention. And for a specific type of revenue, cross-sell expansion revenue, we want to look at every piece of data we have about that customer, the state of their business, their relationship to our product and our, and our business. And we want to identify the handful or dozen of inputs of insights across all of that data to identify which actually have a positive correlation to the outcome I'm trying to drive. And then we want to grade that customer on those dozen conditions and automate what the hell the rep does about it when that grade says they are ready. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. I can have a CRM field that says headcount. Right. That I pulled from Zoom info. Or I and I can have a Tableau report with a login graph. Okay, but that's that isn't that is availability of access to raw data 
and visualization of that raw data so I don't have to look at a table. It's not the same thing as understanding how the triangulation of key data hidden in all that actually leads to an outcome. Right. So that to me is, is kind of the big step when we talk about things being infinitely deep. It's the step we haven't made yet or m- most teams haven't made yet. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, as opposed to, let's say, the, you know, having to de- see a, lo- a looker dashboard or whatever, um, you know, we, we talked about having alerts being sent to uh, the per- that person um, with context and all of that. Um, but the, the, this, um, these insights that, um, kind of triangulate, um, what the data is saying, where does that live? Um, it should live wherever they spend their time. Mm -hmm. So when we talk, um, I mean, I will, this, I will die on this hill. People don't have any more attention left to give to anything in life right employees yeah i have about 100 tabs open here employees don't have any more attention to give Mm -hmm. if your solution to a problem is that they have to go if they have to look at another dashboard i think you failed i mean that i think the the barometer the bar the barrier of entry should be so high now given just how much is out there, how many tools are available, how many systems exist, that if I, if part of getting to value is me asking you to log into something else, to me, that is a non-starter. No way. That is a deal breaker. I'm not logging into anything else because I have no more attention left to give. Okay. So I, you know, like I'm making, I'm kind of making two claims here. I'm making, uh, and I think both are non-controversial. The first claim is that data under uh, data only matters if you can understand it to the extent that you can do something meaningful about it. Storing data is not in and itself, in and of itself, a valuable endeavor. But if storing data in some way gets you to the point where you can drive an outcome that you're responsible for, then it was potentially a worthwhile endeavor. Okay, so. Um, data only matters if you can do something meaningful with it. Okay. The only way to do something meaningful with data is to genuinely understand it and it's impact, not know it exists, not be able to look at it, not be able to move it or transform it, but to genuinely understand how that data means this outcome. Mm. Okay. So data only matters if you can do something meaningful with it. Data understanding, genuine de- deep data understanding is how you use it to drive an outcome that's meaningful. And then the final rule of thumb has to be ease of accessibility, democratization of access. This cannot be gated by a technical team or technical knowledge or technical tools. It cannot require a service request to a data team to build out over four weeks. This cannot require VP admin credentials to look at their dashboard. No, every frontline individual contributor on the team should be able to immediately get access to the insights they need to do their job in the tools they already spend their time on. Yeah. And, and to ask them to do something else, it's punitive. Hey, I, I, you, you get a paycheck here if you hit these outcomes. Okay, this is what I need to hit my outcomes. Okay, we're going to take six weeks to have a data team figure out where the data is. We're going to ha- have our engineering team procure a warehouse that we put it in. We're going to have an engineering team procure a reverse ETL where we take some of that and put it in your workflow tool. Um, when you tell me that you don't have what you need, we're going to have uh, 10 meetings about it. Like that, It's punitive. Do you and, want your people to succeed? And here's the dirty secret. Each one of those teams has a million other things they need to do. And this is probably one of the lowest priorities for them. So even if they get it done in time, it's going to be without much effort. And if something is slightly wrong, it's going to have to go to the back of the list again and do the for the next sprint. Because there's no more attention left to give. 
Right. That's exactly like there's no more attention. I mean, data teams, listen, every employee wants to feel like they're making a real impact on the business and they're happy to take on projects that result in them feeling like that. Mm -hmm. But if they don't feel like providing that rep with this insight is actually meaningful to the business relative to the report that this VP asked them to build, they're not going to do it. And so we are up until now succeeding in spite of ourselves. And now because of the change in market conditions and the um, lack of availability of disposable capital, uh, we now are saying, uh, uh-oh, we got to solve these problems. But there's no one. Uh, otherwise, we got to let these people go. Right. Right. And so, yeah. So, like, uh, to me, data does not matter unless you can make it matter. Right. Okay. It's simply uh, existing doesn't mean that's useful. Um. Listen, my desk. I can put every object on my house on my desk. Doesn't mean that it makes the objects more useful. Just means that I've put them all on my desk, right? It's they're in front of me now. I can visualize them. They're re they're accessible. I can look at it. It does not make them more usable. In fact, it makes my job harder. It's like I can't get to my keyboard when my bicycle's on my desk in the way, right? <laughs> like, you know, I, the the point is not about the data the individual bits of data, putting the data in front of you in its raw format, visualizing the data so it's easier to see. The point is to drive an outcome. It's the whole point. And the, the question everyone should be asking is, how do we weaponize what we already have to drive those outcomes better than we currently do? So how do we do it? What we already have is data. Can we weaponize that data to drive an outcome? You can, but the way to do it is not to go store it and then put it in a, CD, uh, a CDP, which we reverse ETL in its raw format to a uh, uh, Looker uh, dashboard. And then, yeah, exactly. All right. So, yes, yeah. data can be weaponized to drive an outcome. The only way to genuinely weaponize it for the people on the front lines who are responsible for those outcomes is to help them understand it, not see it, understand it. And then motivate or drive what they do about it. And then make sure they can do all of that easily by not requiring them to be elsewhere mm -hmm. where you already are. Right. And so I, I actually think this data problem, I think it's cultural poison. Oof. I think it's cultural poison. If you tell an employee that they are responsible for a thing, and you make it as difficult as possible for them to use the stuff that you already have to do that thing. We listen, we have talked to teams. We're on the call. A RevOps person had said, I'm actually leaving the company because they've not solved this problem. Yeah, awkward. <laughs> That's so awkward. Yeah, so awkward, but a good lesson. And now the company is trying to solve the problem. Right. So you'd hate for the, the thing you'd ultimately hate for if we take this back up to just like the human cost of this, mm -hmm. of any problem. You would hate to see more people laid off because they're unable to create genuine value for the companies that currently employ them. But not because they're incapable, but rather or don't have the aptitude or the work ethic but rather they don't have the standard standardized playbook available to them. Mm -hmm. Do we need more tech layoffs? No. Do we understand why companies are thinking the path forward is tech layoffs? Sure. There's been too much blow. But if we can take the, the standard operating procedure of the best people and replicate that to the people who currently aren't operating at that level, we have a net win. Mm -hmm. Right. People continue to maintain their paychecks and pay their bills and their mortgage and rent and whatever. And companies still hit their growth goals. 
Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think this is a non-trivial issue. I think it's a significant issue, especially given the state of the market and what we've seen other tech companies do. Yeah. And I think th- I think ultimately people just don't understand how deep the iceberg goes under the water. Infinite. In- everything is infinitely deep. I think with uh, that's I think it's a good place to put a pin in it for this week. Um, we've, we've identified several hills that you'll be dying on. <laughs>